Roy, tell us your story. How did someone make the journey all the way from Dallas Theological Seminary to a Willow Creek style um, seeker oriented Sunday services to talking about disciple making movements and using phrases like spiritual terrorists and that kind of thing. So <laughs> how did that journey happen? Well, um, you know, it, it really starts out of a kind of a, a heart for uh, the father's heart in a sense that, that, uh, you know, what, what does God want most? He wants a family and, um, and that family, you know, deserted him in the garden and, and um, he tried to build it again through Israel and, and that, that didn't work out too well. And so when Jesus came, you know, to really uh, sort of cement things, that, that heart has always been in me to, to, to seek the lost and, and to be able to help God uh, join partner with him in, in finding his, his not yet brothers and sisters or my not yet brothers and sisters and put them, you know, bring them into the family. So it's, that it's was amazing. A, it's amazing how that heart can send you on a journey that yeah. you don't <laughs> expect. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. You know, love does amazing things. And uh, so anyway, I, you know, that whole journey is, is, is really um, pieced together by that scarlet thread. And uh, we found ourselves at Shoal Creek, uh, as you mentioned, uh, doing a Willow style uh, service on Sundays, uh, no musical worship on Sundays. Um, we didn't collect people from other churches that were mad or angry because they didn't play the right um, you know, mix of musical worship that they liked. They just didn't find any at Show Creek and they moved on. So we, <laughs> we, we, we grew on the basis of, of lost people. And, and uh, as we found ourselves growing, uh, we, God had blessed us with a uh, piece of property and a building. And we dis discovered as we looked at our growth patterns that we were going to grow out of that pretty quickly. And we didn't think our style of ministry would uh, really uh, fit uh capital campaigns that have to raise money and right. build buildings and all that kind of stuff. So we just said, we need to find a scalable model of ministry. And so we just started looking, you know, what, what, what could allow us to stay in this building and, and make it a training center, you know, not a place that collects people and, and allow us to continue to fulfill the great commission. And, and when you say scalable, you're talking about um, not just uh, have having a movable wall or something you're talking about right. how can we have 200 300,000 people uh being reached in this area yeah, this is where the story gets really weird um you know in the sense that uh we were praying for 300,000 people uh we, we drew a, put a pin in the map drew 30 minutes around and said there's 300,000 people in that circle and let's, let's pray that god would make it hard for them to go to hell because of us and as we as we continued to figure that out and pray, you know, all of a sudden in the middle of this now, you know, one, one key factor here that you mentioned early on, you know, how does a Dallas seminary graduate um, get to <laughs> blah, blah, blah. Well, uh, in the middle of this, I had a dream. Um, and uh, for those that understand the theological landscape, uh, Dallas seminary and dreams don't exactly belong in the same category. <laughs> uh, and so, that dream uh, was a dream that all 300,000 people decided to come to Shoal Creek on a Sunday morning. And so the strategy that we were using to pursue the Great Commission was successful in getting them to start coming. But unfortunately, the strategy wasn't successful in its completion because all 300,000 people couldn't get there on a I, Sunday morning. I, I remember, uh, I think you've I think you wrote about it in spent matches or I've yeah. heard you talking about it, but yeah. how that dream was so sweet at the beginning, because you saw people from so many different backgrounds, you know, mm -hmm. uh, shift workers getting off uh, their night shift, people of ill repute, <laughs> you know, showing yeah. up and yeah. getting ready to go. And it was a sweet dream at yeah. the beginning, but it became a nightmare, right? Yeah, it did because the infrastructure that, that we have in our city doesn't support 300,000 people coming to the same place at one time. So what, what started really sweet turned into tragedy because just the, the infrastructure wouldn't support them getting there. So they turn around and go home. So they start with, you know, a real impetus to connect with God and, and the strategy itself got in the way. Uh, it didn't allow them, you know, to really complete that. And, and that was why the dream turned to a nightmare. And, and it was that dream um, that God was using along with uh, reading the book by um, 
uh, spontaneous expansion of a church mm-hmm. and its hindrances. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And as I was reading that book, you know, written in the 1900s, old, old book, um, yeah. he, he says something to the effect of if your your strategies and your dreams don't match up, it's probably your strategy that's that's a problem because your dreams are probably more inclined to the heart of God. And right. so that's it great. caused me to, to begin to say, OK, uh, if we are going to pray this prayer and, and mean it, then we're going to have to find a different way to go about the, the Great Commission. And so Mm -hmm. that just sent us on a trip, you know, first in the U S trying to talk to every, anybody that we could to find that scalable model of ministry that would allow us to see 300,000 people actually come to Jesus. Um, And then uh, as we went out, you know, we, we failed in the U S just, just nobody in the U S had any kind of scalable model. So I just happened to cross an article by a friend. uh, I didn't know him at that point. Now he's become a dear friend, Jim Egley, uh, who was taking notes, of a Victor John meeting in Nashville with a, a bunch of people uh, who were in, interviewing him about what was going on amongst the Bush Puri in Northern India. Mm, wow. And there were things in that that just lit me on fire, uh, caused me to, to, to start to find all the people I could connected with this. I, I ran into a David Watson through a guy named David Bruderick and um you know, began to just uh, have my life turned upside down as, as they began to ex- mm-hmm. expose me to some principles that would disciple people to conversion rather than evangelize them to conversion. And that, that was right. just, you know, bizarre because I've, I've been through all, I'm, I'm qualified in all the typical evangelism training things that you could do out there, you know, and this idea of, of disciple someone, you know, to conversion was uh, really bizarre, but they, how, how would you me. in a short uh, paragraph, how would mm-hmm. you just delineate between those two things, disciple yeah. someone to conversion as opposed to evangelize them? Well, I, I would, I grew up in a, in a, um, a, a Christianity that, that said that the front porch or the front door was, was basically um, accepting Jesus is like these facts about the cross. That was mm-hmm. the entryway into, you know, the, the, the life. And unfortunately, not only was the entryway, but it usually was the ending way as well. Because, yeah, right. You know, it just get to the cross and that's it. Right. I got my ticket right. to heaven and, and that kind of stuff. Um, and so it was, it was about persuasion. It was about helping people understand that God loves you. You're a sinner. That Christ died for you and you need to receive him um, and to become his child. Um, nothing wrong with that. And I'm not, I I wouldn't deny any of those things as being absolutely fundamentally eternally true. But um, on the other side, I began to realize is that, or or I began to be uh, coached in in helping people understand what would it look like to start reading the Bible um, as the primary start. And so I read the Bible and respond to it in obedience and and respond Mm -hmm. to it by saying, okay, if this is God speaking, what am I going to do about it? And then right. encouraging them then to share that with uh, the people that they, they live, learn, work, and play with. Um, and so that, that simple process of hearing, obeying, and sharing uh, became a, a brand new strategy. Uh, you know, we, we call it a discovery group now. We mm-hmm. have seven questions that we invite people to the table and say, hey, let's just you know, begin to um, explore who God is. And so through a series of small decisions to obey yeah. God. You know, people move a, into the a, family. A, a relational journey mm-hmm. together, right? Yeah. Well, so we're we're definitely going to dive in deeper with that. But getting back to your story, so you were exper- you were hearing stuff about the Bajpuri and Northern India. You were getting messed up by David Watson, things like that. Uh, where did that take you? Well, we, we uh, as a staff, we began to ask ourselves, you know, first, I had a, a period of crazy where I, I, I think I'm crazy. And this is like, you know, really backing the truck up on my entire education, you know, uh, as you can it's see. A, it's, a, it's I call it a stripping away. I just felt oh, like yeah. for a long time, God was just stripping yeah. baggage off of me and I, and it was baggage I was wanting to hold on to. I mean, I felt mm-hmm. comfortable with that stuff. Right. right. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, it was me, you know, unfortunately, and, and, and it felt like ripping skin off our, our identity. Times. Yeah. 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 And that's, I think that's a good thing. I, I know that there are church leaders, pastors, uh, preachers, ministers watching this and 
feeling uncomfortable with some of the ideas they're hearing, um, maybe even wary or, or fearful, or, or I don't know, but that's, um, it's, it's not an easy process, but would you agree as far as once you get through that, it, there's a lot of, for me, there was a lot of burden that God took off of me in that process. Yeah. In several different ways. You know, I, I think of it like, um, my father was in the air force, so I have a real affection for aviation stuff and, um, watching, uh, the sound barrier be broken, you know, in an airplane, there's this moment, uh, as you're approaching that 600 mile, uh, an hour deal that, um, that it, the, the shaking that takes place in the aircraft and it feels like, it, especially before they learn to, to get the airframe, you know, really tuned those early, uh, attempts, it, it shook really violently and, and several people lost their lives or more than several a bunch of people lost their lives trying to do that. It feels like that moment. You know, where you're trying to go through the sound barrier, you're shaking violently, you know, and then on the other side, there's a slipstream and it's just like, and it gets really quiet and calm. And, and that, that's what it, it was for me. And, and there are numerous ways of, of looking at, it. I'm sitting here in a 115 year old house and uh, that has been completely remodeled and, you know, tearing down. Uh, the old stuff, like, you know, there was no wiring in the walls. It was all knob and tube. And, and so we had to wow. strip down and rewire and stuff. And so, you know, there is a deconstruction phase that's very healthy, you know, and you've got to get to some sound footing before you, then you can reconstruct and, and get it back up. And so yeah. that that's what happened to me in that process is I, I began to reread the Bible, you know, with, with really different eyes and, and understand that some of the methodologies that I had accepted as biblical, um, they, they, and, and those methodologies worked. I mean, they saw people come to faith, um, but, but they weren't necessarily founded in the Bible. Um, mm -hmm. you know, they weren't, they weren't commanded by Jesus. And so giving them up was not a matter of, of giving up orthodoxy. And so I had to, I had to really, what a lot of people do is our, our orthopraxy and our orthodoxy are sort of um, it, it twisted together. Yeah. And yeah. we don't realize that our methodologies, you know, aren't necessarily our theology. Right. And so we, we can, we, and we often, well. we often put, uh, those methods up on pedestals where only Jesus belongs. Right. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. uh, we don't realize how much we worship them. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Exactly. So that, that took a while for us, you know, for me to be able to do that. But, you know, it, it allowed us to come through a phase where we looked at what we were doing and, you know, we, we were focused on reaching lost people and, and we were seeing people, you know, connect with their father and, and enter the family. So what we were doing, we didn't look at as bad. Uh, we, we just looked at it and said, look, if we were going to pray for 300,000 people and we were going to really believe that God could use us to bring them to faith, then this is not the only strategy that we need. Um, this will yeah. do a little bit, but it will not complete the task. And so that yeah. allowed us to kind of move into a hybrid strategy uh, that, that I developed, you know, to look at, at this ministry where we, we, we kept the, uh, you know, m the attractional, the collectional thing, because, mm -hmm. you know, on a regular basis, even now and during COVID, we still have plenty of non-believing families who, who, who attend. And it's a great access to quote persons of peace as we you know, were able to rethink yeah. ourselves and understand that term on the other side, it's great access ministry. But if the gospel doesn't move away from us, uh, yeah. if, it, if, if we can't plan it where people live, learn, work and play and really encourage it to move away from us rather than just solely focus on it, moving right. toward us, then we'll never reach those 300,000. When, when they start, experiencing i guess the simplicity of disciple making movements do you have to completely blow up every church structure do you have to get rid of everything before you can do this is there a both and what i'm hearing you say is you you see what you were doing before as a great uh, almost funneling tool <laughs> to to train and funnel people into uh becoming disciple makers, becoming disciples first and becoming mm -hmm. disciple makers almost at the same time. Right. Yeah. yeah. I, I think there's a, um, I wouldn't say there's a synthesis, 
but but there is a tension that can be held that that the analogy of the hybrid car works for me in the sense is that it has an electric engine and it has a gas engine in it. The two are radically different technologies um, and it takes different tools and different methodologies to be able to, to work on them. But within that car, because the mission of the, of, of the automobile is just transportation, the two very different strategies work together for the same goal. So if you can get, you know, the, the right mission in place, you know, then, right. then that's that hybrid strategy can, can work for you because both of them are attempting, you know, to fulfill the great commission. 